If you've listened to Brewlosophy at all, you know how much we love Imperial Yeast. The company was founded on the ideal that if you're going to do something, do it right. From their Imperial Pitch Right pouches, packing a whopping 200 billion cells of healthy and viable yeast in each pouch, to their commitment to commercial customers guaranteeing 10 of their most popular strains are in stock for orders up to 20 liters, or the shipping is free, Imperial Yeast does it right. No more worrying about whether you need to make a starter or propagate your yeast prior to pitching. Imperial Yeast makes it easy for the home brewer and commercial brewer to obtain direct pitches at proper rates when you need it. To place a commercial order or to get more information about everything that Imperial Yeast has to offer, head on over to imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. One of the things I love about brewing science is that we get the opportunity to study not just that something works, but the reasons why it works. Take, for example, the mash. By steeping malted barley in warm water, we make sweet, syrupy solution that can eventually become beer. We could leave it at that, but no way. I wanted to know how malted barley becomes wort. And thankfully, Sosvi Held, uh, then a master student at UC Davis, decided to take a closer look at one of the enzymes and compounds responsible for the mash, and that's beta-glucans and beta-glucanase, two really integral components of the mash, and I got to talk to her last week. I'm your host, Kay Job, and today I'm back in the lab with my co-host, Jordan Folks as we apply the science from last week's episode, beta-glucans and beta-glucanase, under different mash regimes. So, Jordan, welcome back to the lab. Yeah, thanks. Beta-glucans. This is not a topic I really think much about, talk much about. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think in homebrewing circles, you often hear it related to like wheat beers. Uh, and, and maybe we can talk about in this episode whether or not that attribution is even accurate. I don't know. Yeah, right. I mean, that's one of the things I mentioned in the show, too, is like, I mean, I've heard the term beta-glucans, as I'm sure you have, Jordan. I mean, I, I know that they exist, but but I didn't know very much about them. And, you know, I, I, I just mentioned that, like, I love getting into the weeds of brewing science. I mean, obviously, duh, the brewing lab podcast is about that um but it's also fun to just do it the uh, to take the opposite direction right so sophie and i were able to to dive really deep down into the science of beta glucans and beta glucanase um and now today on the show you and i get to sort of take it back up to that high level and say okay here are some of the key takeaways here's how you can use these in your brewing practices and that's what we're going to talk about right well, I think this could be beneficial for me as well, because I actually had to listen to this one a few times to really get it all down. It's really a complicated but interesting uh, conversation. And so uh, I'm hoping that today we can kind of walk it back a little bit for everyone else and uh, try to bring it to some of our others levels. Yeah, for sure. And and I mean, I, this is really cool, too, because like you said, like we don't normally think about beta glucans, but you can't get to the starch to make fermentable sugars unless you get around the beta glucans. Right. So, so it's like everybody focuses on amylase and, you know, strike temperatures for beta amylase or alpha amylase. And that's like such an integral part of brewing. Um, but then I feel like maybe I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's fair to say beta glucans are the forgotten or beta glucanase is the forgotten enzyme. Or I don't know. There's just maybe there's just so much going on that there's a whole bunch of different things that we could talk about um uh, uh, with respect to the mash yeah i mean there's a lot going on in the mash and a lot i don't understand still um it's pretty magic yeah uh well we'll get into everything that sophie and i discussed on the episode but first if you haven't heard becoming a patron of brewlosophy is awesome you get these great feel-good vibes of supporting all the free content we're providing you get awesome rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com and an invite to a monthly live q a session and speaking of content with the addition of the new brewlosophy show on youtube which if you haven't checked that out holy crap this thing is awesome i, I look forward to it every 30 or every thursday martin is doing such a great job but with that the crew's now pumping out original content every day of the work week monday through friday so that's awesome and we keep doing it for free because of our awesome patrons so seriously if you're not a patron i'd really love for you to become one and all you have to do to get the information you need is go to patreon.com slash brewlosophy Another super easy way to support us is by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support. Start your shopping experience by using the links and we get a small kickback. Every little bit helps and it doesn't change your shopping experience at all. And again, you can find all of our affiliate links at brewlosophy.com slash support. 
This week's feedback is brought to you by the dedicated crew at Haas, who bred Sabro from a Neo-Mexicana subspecies growing wild in the mountains of New Mexico. You think you know Sabro? Well, think again. This monster of a hop is efficient when it comes to delivering big flavor. Use less green to save more green, if you know what I mean. And if you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain, try it in the Whirlpool. It's full of aroma and chemical compounds that last from the hot side to the final glass, even if you dry hop on top of it. Sabro is known for its incredible blend of coconut, tropical and stone fruits with a pronounced cream character with flavors of vanilla, cedar, dill, and even mint. And if you can't decide where to use it, no sweat. Sabro's available in all Haas hop formats to meet your brewing needs from highly consistent Lupa Max pellets to efficient incognito and traditional T90 pellets. Learn more about this awesome variety as well as the other innovative products Haas has to offer at johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I, H-A-A-S.com. This week, we got two pieces of feedback about episodes 103 and 104. So episode 103 was with Jeff Daly and Shayla Maloney from John Haas, where we talked about liquid hop extracts. And then episode 104 uh, was applying the science with Jordan. Uh, So Vinny Chalurzo wrote in and he said, Cade, I enjoyed the last couple episodes on hop extract. Thanks for the mention on these episodes. We do, in fact, use hop extract in Pliny the Elder. Uh, I'm actually on a panel at the 2023 CBC on this topic with some friends in the industry. Jeff mentioned the mid 2000s, but it was actually 1999 when I first not only used hop extract in Pliny the Elder, but was also messing around with T45 pellets in the dry hop. Thanks again for mentions <laughs> for the mention. So Jordan, the brewer of Pliny the Elder himself, confirming the use of hop extracts in one of the top tasting beers in the country. It's pretty cool, right? I love how open Vinny is. You know, he's always been like this. That's like one of the original homebrew recipes that it seems that was released out there. Maybe that and um, the uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, right? I love sure, how yeah. open he is about this stuff. And that beer is very clean. So if hop extracts provide a cleaner bitterness, you know, here's one anecdote that is uh, sure fun to try for ourselves. Well, yeah. And I mean, you know, we live on the West Coast now. I'm certainly starting to appreciate those bitter IPAs more. And Piney the Elder is bitter, but it's still got tons yes, of hop aroma. Yeah. I mean, it's bitter. It's dry. It's got a lot of alcohol. It's a fantastic, well-crafted beer. And so maybe that's part of it, right? That bitterness um, is clean and super crisp and it just fits so well uh, in it. So yeah, I mean, again, Vinny, I said it on the show. I love that beer. Um, thanks for writing in that comment. Um, but Vinny also wrote in with another comment. He said, I forgot to mention on a recent, on a recent show, there was a question about a hop that smelled or tasted like lime. I know a New Zealand hop was mentioned, which was Motueka, uh, but there's a new U.S. hop called Zumo from Seagal Ranch that has a really nice lime quality to it. We've brewed with it a couple times, and I'm making another brew with Zumo tomorrow in our pilot brewery. It will be a while before Seagal can get it out in the circulation, more as they're ramping up the acreages. There's just one acre in the ground right now, but when it is available, I would highly recommend it. It certainly isn't a big, over-the-top hop like Citra, but it has a nice finesse to it i have not heard of this one of you no no this is the first one i mean it sounds like there's only one acre in the ground but that's pretty exciting um and steven uh the guy who wrote in the question uh steven if you're listening this sounds exactly like what you were looking for in that summer lager i mean something that's not over the top it shows finesse it probably won't be out this year but once it's out definitely consider giving it a try i mean what about you jordan does it sound like a hop you'd be interested to try I mean, I love Motueka, and I was recently drinking on a uh, pale lager I made with Rawaka, and I think I'm getting some lime there, so that might be another one to try. And I really like a little bit of lime in, um, in a pale lager, especially. I think it works really great. Great uh, modern, dry, you know, clear West Coast IPA. I think it's a great element. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to try Zumo someday. Yeah, exactly. I, whenever it comes out, I'll definitely put it in my rotation, and we'll have to throw it in the Hop Chronicles too, um, and and, and uh, test it out there. Well, cool. Uh, Thanks, Vinny, for that recommendation and for answering the listener's question and also for listening and providing the feedback about Pliny the Elder. All right, we're going to take a short break and then we'll be back talking about beta-glucans and beta-glucanase. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear, and there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet.
Clearly, there's a lot that goes on during the mash. Most people are familiar with the amylases that break down starches to fermentable sugars. That's alpha and beta amylase. You know, the reason why we mash between, you know, 60 to 70 Celsius or 140 to 160 Fahrenheit. But you have to get access to those starches, which are all wrapped up in beta glucans and require an enzyme, beta glucanase, to break them down. So, Jordan, before the show, what did you know about beta glucans? Honestly, not a whole lot. You know, it seems like it's one of those phrases that homebrewers that think they know everything like to throw around like, oh, you know, <laughs> got to watch out for the beta glucans in this beer. Um, and I don't know how much any of us actually know about this. So it was a really interesting episode. I learned a lot. Yeah, me too. And and I loved it, right? Because I'm not going to say it, maybe it's a lesser known enzyme, but it's still a super integral piece of this, right? I mean, um, so I mean, yeah, that was kind of the overall sh- concept of the show was for me to learn about beta glucans and beta glucanase, what they are and what they do. And then um, to understand the main goal of Sophie's work, which to understand how beta glucan activity changes using different mash profiles, malt bills, and levels of malt modification, um, which I thought was really cool, too, because not only did we get to talk about um, uh, an enzyme that I wasn't familiar with, but we got to talk about different mash profiles, what they look like, different malt bills, levels of malt modification, and we went kind of quickly in the show through all that because I wanted to be able to get through all of the content and all the results, but you and I can spend some time today actually breaking all this down into a little bit more detail and going a little slower and talking through some of this stuff. Great. Well, maybe we can start with the overall concept, and I'd love for you to kind of give us a high-level overview of what exactly a beta-glucan is. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so this was this was cool, right? A, a beta-glucan, as I understand it, um, and I think Sophie did a great job of explaining this on the episode, so I direct you back to that uh, for a much better explanation. But as I understand, right, w- what we care about as brewers are the starches. Well, we care about fermentable sugars, right? That's what we care about. And there's balls of starches, uh, like amylope pectins that are inside the barley kernel endosperm. That's where the barley stores all of this for it's a seed, right? It's whenever the seed drops into the ground and it gets wet, it germinates and it takes all of the stored up sugar and converts it to energy to grow a barley plant, right? So as brewers, all of those enzymes that the plant would do in the ground, that's essentially what we're starting to do in malting, right? Is get access to that sugar so that we can use it for energy. There's a lot of steps that go into that, and I'm not going to break all of that down, but suffice it to say that all of those sugar starch molecules are wrapped up in this complex matrix of proteins and and um, I, I can't remember exactly what she said, you know, carbohydrates and, 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 and proteins. And one of those is beta glucan and beta glucan is kind of like the sticky glue that kind of holds everything together. There's another one called arabinoxylans, which we didn't really touch in, on in the show. But to get to the starches, you got to do something with all that sticky protein stuff, right? You got to get to the starches so that the amylases can then work on, you know, the alpha amylase can break down the long chains and then the beta amylase can break off the little maltose molecules that that yeast can then ferment. So it's kind of this whole like getting to, it's like unwrapping a package. I thought that was a great um, analogy that Sophie said, right? It's like ripping off the wrapping paper. You So you're, you there's an enzyme that's ripping off the wrapping paper of the package and then there's the box, right? And then you open up the box and then, and then you get inside the box and that's where all the gifts and presents are but there's still all this like paper and everything that has to get ripped out um, and thrown out and that paper that's like in the box surrounding the present those are beta glucans okay but then what so what is a beta glucan right so a, if a starch via the mash we can convert to a fermentable sugar right and then uh, yeast can consume that, convert that to ethanol. Well, what function, what purpose, or uh, what problem does a beta glucan create? Yeah, that's a good one, right? The problem, I think, is where is where I. This is what I knew about beta glucans before, and I think I suspect you too, right? Is a beta glucans are a protein, um, and when they get ripped out of the of the cardboard box, for example, they're really sticky. And they stick to everything. They stick to stuff. Um, and it, it's kind of like it, um, I think. Um, I, I think the analogy that Sophie said is it's kind of like its job is to agglomerate things, right? For things to stick to it, so it can hold it together. It's a structural thing, and it does. It's really sticky, so lots of stuff sticks to it, and that can make for what we would say like a stuck sparge, right? Like a sparge where you're not able to get the liquid out of the grains because everything is just stuck together. Okay, so when we um, malt barley, we can modify it, right? And uh, the modern malt is uh, very highly uh, modified. 
Um, so is beta glucan like getting destroyed during the modification process? And so that it's already naturally present in like the barley seed, but the malting process helps chip some of it away or is the malting process actually uh, bringing it to an existence in the first place? So I think this is one of the cool things that I learned from the show. I I didn't know this until Sophie told me this, but it's a little bit, it's like chipping it away, but to different degrees, right? So like depending on what the maltster is doing, again, the maltster, the whole point of malting and that germination stage is to prime the enzyme package and get everything ready to go for the brewer, right? Um, so that the brewer can have easy access to those starches and then the amylases can turn those into fermentable sugars. So priming is like getting all the enzymes ready. Well, the way you get the enzymes ready is you get the seed to start making all those enzymes and then those enzymes start working right? I mean, with the enzymes are there, the chemical reaction is going to happen. Um, we'll talk about this on a future episode. I've got Shilpi Halamane um, coming in on the next episode to talk about brewing with enzymes. And we'll talk about how enzymes help reduce activation energy uh, for a chemical reaction. I'll leave that there for now. But essentially, enzymes just make things faster. And if enzymes are present and two molecules you know, come together, if the enzyme attaches to the substrate or the substrate attaches to the active side of the enzyme, a chemical reaction is going to happen. So yes, there is going to be some conversion, uh, um, some release of beta glucan and also some conversion of beta glucan through beta glucanase into a non-sticky sort of non, um, non-aromatic, non-functioning um, compound, I guess we'll say, to a benign substance, let's call it that. It just doesn't have any relevance. It just like breaks down into pieces and gets used for other stuff. Um, so yeah, so there is some release of beta, beta glucans that happens during the malting process and also some breaking down of beta glucans that happens in the process. And to your point, modification is just the amount of enzyme activity that you're able to prime, right? It's like the amount of enzymes that the uh, that the barley has as a result of the mar- malting process. It's how well that enzyme package was made, right, and ready to go. Does that make sense? So uh, we need starches and fermentable sugars to make beer. Do we need beta glucans? Like, if we could breed this out, would we still make beer as we know it today? I mean, that's a good question. I don't know if you can breed it out because, again, it's it's providing this structure, right? It's sticky. So I'm guessing that this is just totally Cade talking here. I don't know. Maybe I'd have to ask like Pat Hayes or a barley breeder on this uh, sometime. But I'm guessing those starch molecules are sticking to the uh, uh, beta glucans and the arabinoxylans, and that's what's making the endosperm. You know, like when you bite a barley kernel, like a regular barley kernel, you know, it's like super hard and like crunchy in the middle. It tastes like it like breaks mm-hmm. your teeth when you bite it. Yeah. I mean, I think that that what makes it hard is not the starches and carbohydrates. It's those beta glucans and uh, uh, arabinoxylans. So I think it's actually serving a really um, important purpose for the seed itself, like durability so that the seed can survive and potentially be eaten by animals and then, you know, pooped out in other places and spread around and all that. So I think it's actually you might hurt the plant itself or the viability of the crop if you tried to breed that out. But I wonder if you could breed like lower amounts of beta glucans. And maybe that is something that has happened over the years, let alone GMO. So yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can get into this, you know, the actual study. So we've, I think we've got a decent understanding of what these things are. Um, but m- maybe you can remind the listeners about um, Sophie's work. Yeah, of course. So Sophie's work was fun, right? It was looking at um, basically three different parameters. So she wanted to understand what's going on with beta-glucans and beta-glucanase during the mash. Um, And she looked at two different mashes. And I want to spend quite a bit of time here with you talking about the different mashes because we went through those pretty quickly in the show. But that's parameter number one, two different mash regimes, we'll call it. Then the next thing is what you and I've just been talking about, modification, all right? How well modified the malt is how well that enzymatic package was primed and how easily it's going to be to get the sugars um, out of the starches. So as you know, Jordan, we've got highly modified malts today. We didn't have highly modified modified malt hundreds of years ago. Everything was very under modified. So there's these, uh, this is a second piece, a second parameter to study is how important is that priming step. 
Um, and then the third one was malt bill. Um, so she actually did, you know, 10 different combinations of malt. But the main thing for the malt bill was what does the addition of caramel malt do? So it turns out caramel malt has high starting beta glucan percentages. So what does that do to the beta glucan um, in, in in the word? Or think about this one. She didn't do this in, in her study, but think about like adding adjuncts like rye or oats or wheat. You know, anybody that's brewed with those, I know you have. I mean, that mash is viscous and thick. Um, you know, those are sort of famous for having stuck sparges. So this is kind of like, okay, when you're adding something else in, and in this case, she chose caramel malt um, that has a high beta-glucan starting percentage. Um, so she took those three parameters, right? Mash regime, malt modification, and malt bill, really the addition of caramel, and looked at uh, initial beta-glucan content and then how beta-glucan content changed throughout the malt or throughout the uh, the mash and then how much was left at the end. And one really cool part, which we'll talk about when we come back from the break is this assay that she used, which measures both of the, both the beta glucan content and the enzyme at the same time. And I'll talk about how important that is from a scientific perspective, because usually you don't measure those at the same time, um, which means it's very difficult to say for sure that you have this amount of enzyme in the wor- in the solution and this amount of beta glucan at the same time point, because you're measuring them in two different assays. So you can't really um, say it for sure. So it's pretty cool that she was able to do that, but we can talk about that after the show. I think we should start with the, um, the mash regimes, don't you think? Yeah, let's walk through them. Yeah, so um, I'll break this down, um, and then uh, I, I've got some questions for you, too, about, about this, Jordan, because I think this would be a pretty interesting discussion. So the two mashes that she looked at were the European Brewing Congress, or so-called Congress mash. That's a step mash. It's a mash that starts at a lower temperature or lower than most brewers are, are used to uh, mashing in at, <clears throat> and then it ramps up slowly uh, all the way up to 70 C. So let me break it down for you. So it starts at, at you spend 30 minutes at 45 degrees Celsius, which is 113 Fahrenheit. And stopping right there for a second, that's really low, right, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I've probably done it a couple times because you saw some old, you know, German recipe that starts there. But I mean... That is seems very antiquated at this point. <laughs> right. You know, and uh, that's interesting. Why do you say it's antiquated? Well, I, you know, the, I, maybe the original How to Brew book recommended a protein rest, but now it's kind of like um, secondary fermentation, you know, in your plastic bucket. These are things that we don't do anymore. And it seems that uh, the advice from yesteryear isn't really uh, appropriate anymore. And you hear things like, uh, oh, you know, with how modified... Uh, modern malts are the the protein rest. You're actually not doing yourself any favors, and you're actually be like maybe killing head retention if I'm remembering that correctly. And that basically we just don't need it anymore, and it runs the risk of actually being a detrimental step. Is what I've yeah. heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so that that protein rest, right? Proteins, beta glucans. Like those are the things that are that are happening right there at, at that low temperature, which I thought was pretty cool. And, and I guess we should stop here, too, and mention that um, that 45 degrees Celsius is pretty much uh, right around. I think it's a little bit above, but it's pretty close to the optimal temperature for beta glucanase to operate. Right. Um, and, and so that protein rest is important. And we just talked about modification. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. Right. When malts were under modified, we needed to spend more time at this low temperature so that we could break down beta-glucans and get access to the starches and sugars, right? So it sort of makes sense. And like you said, you see these old German recipes that start at like 115 Fahrenheit or something like that, um, and you stay there for a while. But you don't do it anymore. I don't do it anymore. Almost nobody uh, that I know of, even commercial brewers, I'm not sure many commercial brewers are even doing step mashes anymore. Almost everybody that I know of is doing an infusion mash, just coming straight in at mash temperature. Well, a few things. I mean, one, if you are doing a step mash, like I use them all the time for uh, German lagers and, um, sure. you know, Kolsch or um, Belgian beers as well, is you're not really starting with the protein rest. You're starting maybe a beta rest, maybe like that 130 range or so. But a lot of us are just starting at like 144. Um, and so we've skipped quite a few degrees there. Uh, but the other thing is that I don't really s- recall a lot of recommendations to do this 30 minute protein rest. It's like do five, <laughs> 10, 15 minutes and then move on to 130, 144 or so on and so forth. So that's a really long time at a really low temperature. Uh, also, you know, from a home brewing perspective or a pro brewing perspective, that's just one more step that you got to add. And um, you're just going to really drag your brew day out when you're starting that low, when you know you got to go higher 
in order to start actually uh, converting sugars uh, appropriately. Yeah, and I mean, that's a great point, right? The the uh, beta amylase might be active at those temperatures, but its optimal is a lot higher, right? Um, and, and so that's super important to get. Uh, and then that's not even talking about alpha amylase, right? Alpha amylase has a much higher um, uh, optimum temperature. Um, so, okay, back to the European Brewing Congress uh, mash, the Congress mash. You'll hear this all the time in scientific studies, especially that deal with malt, Congress mash. So it's 30 minutes at 45 Celsius or 113 Fahrenheit. And then in, in, in my opinion, incredibly slow rise it goes at one degree celsius per minute for 25 minutes from 45 celsius to 70 celsius so you've got 30 minutes at 113 and then 25 minutes to go all the rest of the way right like like or uh, i'm sorry it, it's it seems like an incredibly fast sacrification rest that's what i meant to say not slow right you're going all the way from 113 fahrenheit up to 158 fahrenheit so that's 70 celsius 158 fahrenheit in 25 minutes yeah and then 158 is pretty high right and so w- what we believe to be true is that when you mash high you end up with a less fermentable wort and uh, you're gonna have more you know a higher fg uh, more residual sugar ostensibly a sweeter tasting beer as well maybe a thicker mouthfeel and uh I was kind of surprised when I started looking at the Fahrenheit conversions, because I think in Fahrenheit, like, wow, they're going from a a level that's probably not converting a whole lot to very quickly getting to a point where you're like really only getting those long chain sugars. So it makes me wonder how fermentable of a wort does this method even create? (laughs) You know, and it's interesting too, right? I mean, this method is intended to create a uh, fermentable wort, a very fermentable wort. Um, It's measure. It's, it, it is the method that you'll see on, um, uh, certificates of analysis. So like when you look at a certificate of analysis and when it says like the percent extract, you know, fine grind or coarse grind on a certificate of analysis, um, it's doing this via a Congress mash, um, for, for the most part. It depends a little bit on the the manufacturer and which which assay and method that they're following. But for the most part, they're doing something very similar to a Congress mash. And the important piece of this is it's standardized. Um, it's a standardized method that all brewers, um, all maltsters, everyone can do. It's very specific. It includes details like the grist particle size and the filtration, the exact filters that you have to use. It even talks about like the setup um, in, in terms of the the metal cylinders that you have to have. I mean, there's a there's actually an official apparatus. Um, there's some cool pictures of it online. If you Google like Congress Mash apparatus, um, there's like it's like these little silver wells, and they have little stir bars in them and stuff. It's pretty cool um, to see. Uh, but but it's, it's very very specific, and the whole point is that from a scientific perspective it's very consistent it's incredibly repeatable and it's comparable across all labs and brewing equipment so it's kind of like a pure analysis of the malt itself well that being said it's like who's doing this in an actual <laughs> brew house right and i mean even in even in germany czech republic etc and so uh i think that that's uh, a common criticism of brew brew lab um you know, brewing science, benchtop tests, laboratory tests is, uh, they're not done in a really applied environment. And it's these hypothetical scenarios that don't necessarily reflect the reality of modern professional or home brewing. Um, and just like making, doing some sort of test on hop aroma and a beer that was brewed in a manner that no one would, that would, would not create a product that wouldn't want anyone would actually want to consume. And so I really like this idea of doing research and like on a Pilsner that you're actually going to drink and enjoy using uh, real uh, real world applications of you know various techniques. And so I'm curious, have you ever heard of someone using the Congress mash for production beer? Nah, no, I, I really haven't. I mean, I even even I would say like there, I could count on my hand the number of brewers that are even doing a step mash other than like, you know, I mean, there there are mechanics that are involved there, right? Or like engineering challenges because you're heating up huge volumes of liquid and, you know, you've got to get it all mixed up. It takes a long time to raise something from, you know, 113. To, it takes a long time to raise 30 barrels from 113 to 140 to 150 to boil, right? And, and so there are mechanical challenges that brewers are, that commercial brewers are having to deal with. But I could count on my one... 
uh, one hand, the number of brewers that are doing a step mash intentionally because they want to do a step mash or because they believe that a step mash does the like a, a better makes a better beer um, than the infusion mash. I mean, there's equipment challenges, but honestly, I don't see anybody doing this this Congress mash, right? I mean, again, 30 minutes at a really low temperature, a super fast rise all the way up to 158 Fahrenheit or 70 C, which is pretty high. Um, that's going to be pushing your beta amylase conversion if you're even still you're probably still getting some beta amylase conversion at that rate. But like you said, that beta amylase is fermentability. Beta amylase is, you know, the shorter chains that the, that the sugars can, can use. So at that temperature, when you get up to 158, you're creating sort of an unfermentable wort. Um, and it sits there at 158 for 10 minutes. So it's a 65 minute mash, which, you know, isn't necessarily that long, but it's, it, yeah, I'd like, I, I mean, it would be interesting. I'd love to have somebody on the show to talk about like why the Congress mash is why it is, right? Why was it designed this way? Is it just a historical hangover, um, you know, from how brewers were doing it for a long time? Is it because it's the only standardized method? And I think that one uh, I can challenge uh, because uh, we definitely talked about the second method um, that Sophie used in this, which is the Institute of Brewing and Distilling's infusion mash method. Now, Sophie didn't follow exactly the IBD's method. Um, there was a, a, a co-author on their paper, Dr. Evan Evans, who I've had on the show before, made some modifications to the infusion mash to make it more realistic. And I think most brewers um, are, are going to understand uh, are, are going to understand this one. So for this mash, the infusion mash, uh, you're doing 50 minutes at 65 Celsius. So that's not a low low temperature. It's just straight in at mash temperature. 65 Celsius is 149 Fahrenheit. So right in that normal mashing range that most brewers are doing. And honestly, this is where I'm at for most of my beers, somewhere between 148 and 154, right? I mean, I think that's in terms of Fahrenheit because that's how I think of. So that's somewhere between like, you know, 60 and, and, and 67 or 68 Celsius, something like that. Um, and so it's 50 minutes at that level. And then you do a two and a half degree Celsius per minute rise um, from uh, from uh, 65 to 74. Uh, so that's from 149 Fahrenheit up to 165 Fahrenheit, which takes like four minutes, <laughs> you know, versus 24 minutes. Um, and then you do a 10 minute mash out rest at 74 uh, Celsius or 165 Fahrenheit, which is also a total of about 64 minutes. So these two mashes are the same length, but why? wildly different um, in terms of the mash. And I know for sure I'm almost exclusively doing the IBD infusion mash in my brewing. So that one seems way more practical, at least in what I do normally. Yeah, I mean, I think that most American brewers, uh, pro and home brewers, are using some sort of um, single infusion mash. And I think on the pro brewing scale, uh, part of it is equipment limitations. I think that uh, a lot of the equipment is kind of modern, uh, modeled after the English system, which is a single infusion, you know, oriented system. Um, and then also there's just the labor and the time, you know, it takes more time. Um, I think that this would be a really cool brewlosophy experiment actually to do a, a Pilsner or something like that using these two methods. I love that they take the same amount of time, uh, total <laughs> yeah. and we yeah. could see, are there di observable differences, you know, fermentability at, um, OG, FG, et cetera, as well as, uh, do they taste different? Yeah, I mean, there was a, there's an older experiment which Jake did with the Hotchkers mass, mash. Um, I think I said that right, Hotchkers, which is a step mash that looks something similar to uh, the Congress mash. But yeah, it'd be fun to just like follow these two specific protocols um, and see what you get uh, with, with the beer. And it's funny, too, that you mentioned it's more like an English single infusion mash because guess where the Institute of Brewing and Distilling is based? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? There you go. It's in the UK and, and the EBC heavily influenced uh, by German brewers, right? The European European Brewing Conference, mm. heavily, heavily influenced uh, by German brewers. So, you know, we talk about like there's this kind of historical German practice of raising from 113, you know, slowly and then going up 113, 115 and then slowly going up uh, to, to sacrification. Um, so it's really interesting. The other thing, too, that to keep in mind about this IBD mash is they also specify the you know grist particle size, the liquor to grist ratios, filtration and everything. Um, and much like uh, our normal infusion mash, it 
it has a thicker mash, right? So a lower liquor to grist ratio. So there's like more malt uh, compared to like hot liquor, um, just like you would do in sort of normal brewing practices, right? That's again, uh, a function of, of, you know, historical UK brewing. You do really thick mashes because there was a time when the mash ton was uh, taxed, right? And that was where you you had to pay your taxes. So you got these thick mashes. But in, in at least in my opinion, um, and again, I don't do much malt research. So this isn't like Cade the scientist. This is just sort of like Cade the home brewer and my brewing experience. Um, you know, the IBD mash seems way more like what most brewers are doing. And it seems like, you know, if you're going to study malt or beta gluconase or, uh, um, you know, or beta glucan contents, that you really need to do what people are doing. And that's exactly what Sophie did uh, in this study, which I thought was awesome. Yeah. And I think that this is a good opportunity to kind of like talk about why you would use one mash or the other historically or in the modern context. And then what does that mean for beta glucans? And, you know, I think that one argument for a step mash and not necessarily the Congress specifically, but step mash in general is that I would imagine, and I've experienced this in my own home brewing, is you do you do get a more efficient uh, mash. You're going to get uh, more sugars per pound of grain extracted uh, when you do this. And I don't know if it's necessarily a function of more stirring or uh, more time on average spent there, um, but it does seem to make a more efficient mash. Uh, additionally, uh, allegedly, it creates a more fermentable uh, wort and that you're able to uh, really dry a beer out better when you're using step mash, especially if you're using a decoction as one way to get each additional step. And then finally, um, allegedly, the the step mash is going to get you a more deeper, like complex wort, right? Because the, the lower range where you're getting your beta rest, you're getting the fermentability, but then you go a little higher and you can get some more malt complexity while still getting a drier beer. And it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? And they say that this one of the secrets to good Hellas is by getting that fermentable step, you're going to dry the beer out. Um, but if you were just start high and have a really sweet wort, it's going to finish too sweet. And so they say that this uh, step mash is really able to get all the good things we want in a mash. But obviously, the limitation here is time and effort. It's a lot more difficult to do this. And a single infusion mash is certainly tempting if you can find a sweet spot that gets you kind of just enough of what you need to get by. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like we talk about this all the time at Brewlosophy, right? I mean, especially like, Mar you know, me and Marshall in the short and shoddy series and all that kind of stuff uh, that we do at Brewlosophy. We talk about it all the time. It's kind of like, you know, uh, especially at a homebrew scale, I could care less about efficiency, right? I just throw an additional hand for, handful of grain in and then I don't care if I hit 65 efficiency or whatever. But for a commercial brewer um, and, uh, you know, I, I think even like a brewer that's brewing, uh, you know, trying to maximize their system and their extraction and their formidability and all those factors, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned that it makes a more formidable wort. And again, that makes sense from the enzymes perspective, right? Because we're unpacking more of that starch. We're getting rid of the barriers, the beta-glucans and the arabinoxylans that are in the way of the starch. So yeah, it starts to make sense that this is more formidable. You're spending time in those ranges that make it a more formidable wort, but you still have the ability to play with, like you said, the, then, you know, ramp it up faster to a higher temperature and you get more, you know, quote, malt, per, malt complexity. You get more of those long chain sugars that to me makes like total sense. Yeah. And I'm convinced that I can tell a difference on certain styles that I think a Hellas it's in anecdotally, it really does seem to make a difference that my step matches. It makes a cor more complex beer in the malt character. And I really enjoy it. But, um, something like an IPA, it's like, that's not what you're going for. And so I think that it's a, a tool in our toolkit and we, uh, use the right tool for the right job. Uh, so I'm excited to kind of re revisit some of these experiments personally and see if I can taste a difference. Um, but what this study that Sophie did looked at is, uh, maybe not so much flavor impact, but actually measurable differences in terms of beta glucan and beta glucanase content uh, between these two mashes. So maybe we can take a second seat to talk about what she found uh, as it relates to these two approaches and what it means for the uh, subject of today's episode. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's take a short break and then we'll do it. Mm -hmm. 
One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. While there are some differences between mashing methods, such as a step mash like the Congress mash and a single infusion mash like the Institute of Brewing and Distillings protocol, both methods can be used to make beer, which is why both methods are still used in practice. Now, Jordan, you mentioned a little bit that uh, that you've used, um, you know, occasionally for Jordan log or for for uh, for Jordan loggers, <laughs> for German loggers, uh, that you occasionally use the step mash. Like, how often in your brewing are you using a step mash versus like a single infusion? I'm just curious because for me, it's almost 100% single infusion. Right. Yeah. I'm a strong believer that certain styles deserve certain treatments, but be it the the mash, uh, you know, the ingredients, uh, the glassware that you serve it in. And so uh, if I'm making a German or Czech lager, you can guarantee that I am step mashing, which may or may not include decoction to hit those steps. Um, But, you know, IPA or if I was to make like a an English porter, single infusion, and that's easier. Um, and in the English example, it's probably appropriate, um, historically speaking. But also, you know, the the malt complexity that you ostensibly get from a step mash isn't necessary or even appropriate in an IPA. And so, uh, given that I'm brewing maybe 50% lo- German Czech style lagers, maybe I'm step mashing half the time. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, so it is interesting, right? And we sort of see, like, here's an example. Um, you know, so Jordan is a person who could potentially use both of the Cong- Congress mash and the single infusion mash, it, the, uh, the results from those studies to impact his brewing methods, right? Because he's using both, um, which I think, again, is is really awesome. And I don't want, I didn't want this episode, uh, you know, when I was talking with Sophie or even now to devolve into like, which method is better. Um, you know, they're just different and they do different things. Um, and and it was important, right, to remember that the the point of Sophie's study was to look at beta glucans, beta gluconase, um, <clears throat> and see what those are doing in the mash. And she did that by looking at three different parameters. It wasn't just mash method; it was also malt modifi- malt modification, um, and then what I'm calling the presence of caramel malts. But it was malt bill, right? Some of these were, um, you know, lower modified malts, and then the presence of caramel malts um, and some uh, uh, some mixes there. But the big takeaway uh, from this study is is that all three parameters parameters had an impact, right? So mash method mattered for beta glucan, beta glucans and beta glucanase act activity, malt modification mattered, and also uh, the presence of caramel malts. That's pretty interesting, right? To think that, okay, we're always talking about tools in the toolkit. And it seems like, wow, all three of these are tools in the toolkit for if you're dealing with stuck sparges or sticky mashes or something like that. Right. And so maybe we can break down what she found for, for each condition. So uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, that on the uh, mash method variable, that they found that the European Brewing Congress's approach was a better remedy for beta glucans. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think it, I, I think it wasn't even close. I don't remember the raw numbers, and I didn't write them down. I direct you back to the episode for that. Um, but it was much higher. Like the the infusion mash had much higher beta gluconase, um, and that was you know um, regardless of or independent of the starting beta gluconase beta glucan content, right? 
Um, so it wasn't like they used higher, uh, you know, malts with higher beta glucans in the infusion mash. No, no, no. It's independent of the starting beta glucan content. Um, it, it, there was more beta glucans in the wort under the infusion mash, under the, the IBD mash. And, you know, you start to think about this and you go like, okay, well, why is that? I asked Sophie that question. Of course, the answer seems very um, straightforward and, and easily explainable. You spend so much time at that lower temperature on the EBC mash that beta glucan the enzyme that breaks down beta glucans has the ability to do more act more right so it can take even malts even under modified malts with high starting beta glucans and break those down to levels that are low um, or at least passable or 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 you know not going to cause any issues in your brewing process and you know what i found interesting about that is don't they claim that one of the reasons that you mash out is to improve laudering and so that's a higher temperature, right? And so I was just surprised. I kept like rewinding the episode. I was like, wait, no, I thought hotter temperatures meant better runoff. And so that really challenged that understanding for me. I guess uh, that's less so about maybe the chemistry, but more about just the physical temperature helps lauder the wort better what do you think about that yeah maybe i mean i don't know it could be things are more soluble at higher temperature i mean i don't know um there's also a piece of this too i've mentioned it already a couple of times and we didn't talk about it on the show a lot um it's arabinoxylans and that's another one that i don't know a lot about um i know that they're present i know they form they they um uh, perform a function similar to beta glucans beta glucans are talked about more than arabinoxylans um not sure exactly why maybe i can get somebody on the show in the future to help us understand that. Um, but to me, it seems like there's got to be other things going on, right? It's not just beta glucans. And maybe this is a good spot to mention too. Um, one of the measurements that Sophie did was looking at wort viscosity. All right. Um, and so this is kind of jumping way ahead because we don't have any of the other results yet. Well, you did, you listened to the show. So hopefully you already know what the results are. Um, and, and this one really challenged my preconceived beliefs because I thought higher beta glucans meant higher stickier higher wort viscosity stickier wort right stuck sparge if you've got more beta glucans in the in the wort it's going to be stickier um but she didn't observe any differences in wort viscosity between the congress mash or the infusion mash um which to me just kind of like blew my mind a little bit but she did say that she experienced a slower runoff. So maybe viscosity is just not a uh, good reliable measurement of water speed. Yeah, well, it, that's a good point, right? And we're talking about filtration as a, as a key component of both the EBC and the IBD methods, right? So these bills are filtered, and then the wort is then measured, right? So maybe even the filtration has something to do with that. But you would still think that there'd be some higher level of stickiness that got there. At least maybe this is just me fighting it <laughs> and, and trying to confirm my own pre preconceived beliefs. Uh, but I would have thought, like, that's just one of those things that I've always been, that I've been trained to think. Like, you have been trained, like, mass out means you know better runoff uh I, i've been trained to think higher beta glucans having more protein and sticky substances in your wort means hazier beer and also problems with the runoff right mm -hmm. sticky runoff i mean it's the reason why rye has always gotten such a bad rap to me right because rye um i, I thought um had <laughs> had higher uh beta glucans although i guess you and i right before the show um we looked it up <clears throat> and rye actually is way lower than barley <laughs> in terms of the beta glucan content. So, yeah. Yeah, that 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 was my question was you always hear that uh you need to use rice hulls when using wheat uh or oats or rye if using a large percentage because you're going to get stuck mash and maybe erroneously home brewers often attribute that to beta glucan content. And so my thought was surely wheat rye and oats have higher beta glucan contents than barley and so kate and i actually looked this up before the episode and barley is listed as having the highest amount and so that really blew my mind and so what i'm hypothesizing and maybe uh, a smart listener can uh, call in and let us know um, this feedback is maybe wheat rye and oats especially if they're in an unmalted format simply have less beta gluconase to actually uh, act on the already fairly low levels of beta glucans. And so that's why you're getting this more likely to have a stuck sparge is even though there's less beta glucans to begin with, there's also in turn fewer beta glucanase enzymes to work on them, thus mm -hmm. resulting in um, higher, you know, stuck mash 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I could issues. I could totally see that. And right, and think about most of the anecdote is also going to come from people using infusion mashes, right? That mm-hmm. aren't doing mm-hmm. the step mash. So you're you're kind of like you're you you're maybe starting with lower beta glucan content, but you like you said, less uh enzyme activity and in temperature conditions that aren't going to support the enzyme activity. But yeah, so this is actually from a 2011 paper on beta glucans, and it says among cereals, the highest content in terms of grams per 100 grams of dry weight of beta glucan has been reported for barley, which is two to 20 grams per 100 grams. <laughs> that I mean, 20 grams, that's like 20% um, beta glucans. Um, for oats, three to eight grams. Sorghum, 1.1 to 6.2. Rye, 1.3 to 2.7. Maize, uh, 0.8 to 1.7. Triticale, 0.3 to 1.2. Wheat, 0.5 to 1. Durham wheat, 0.5 to 0.6. And rice, 0.13. So in order, barley highest, oats, sorghum, maize, triticale, wheat, durum wheat, and rice. Oh, sorry. Sorghum, rye, maize, triticale, wheat, durum wheat, and rice. That's not how I thought that list was going to go. Yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. <laughs> so um, maybe that's a good transition to talk about the uh, grist composition in terms of what that meant. Now, she didn't actually test any of those uh, non-barley varieties you just mentioned, did you? Did no, she? Cor- no, correct. Yeah, so it was all barley, but she did do the uh, malt modification. Um, and I think we should start there before we talk about the caramel malts, because I think it makes sense, right? Um, and so, again, we talked about modification is the enzyme package, priming those enzymes to be ready to do um, what we need them to do in the mash. And so, um, uh, so... The modification is super important. So she did uh, essentially three combinations of modification, 100% either two row or pills um, uh, for the base malt, right? And then combined that with 10% or 20% unmalted barley. So essentially you've got six conditions. You got 100% pills, 10%... Um, unmalted or 10% unmalted, 90% pills, 20% unmalted, 80% pills, then 100% two row, 10% uh, unmalted 90%, you know, uh, 20% unmalted 80% two row. So hopefully that makes sense. But those are the malt modifications. And the whole point of this was to just see, you know, uh, how well is beta glucan a, a be- how well are beta glucans digested? Because the more under modified the malt is, so the less the enzymatic package is primed in malt, the higher the starting beta glucan content. Um, so that was to your question right at the top of the show, Jordan, which was about like modification and whether whether beta glucans are broken down during the malt process. And to me, I think the answer based on Sophie's, uh, what Sophie told me in this research is yes, there is some beta glucan conversion that happens um, in the malt house. And so if you're using under modified malt, those beta glucans still need to be broken down so that you can get access to those starches to turn into sugar. Okay. And so she found, right, that the 100% malted barley beers had lower final beta glucan content both lower starting content and lower final content Mm, yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so so so, yeah so i think that these two findings the mash process finding and the malt modification finding together in tandem tell an interesting story because the modern interpretation of things like a step mash is they're esoteric right it's like oh well you know they didn't have they didn't even thermometers yet and the malt was so lowly modified it's like they had to right and so now that we have super modified malt the argument is that you don't need to do a step mash for conversion because a single infusion mash will effectively convert highly modified malt and so I think this is an interesting component to that um, kind of modern brewing wives' tale is that perhaps there was also a need to do a step mash when we had lower modified malts in order to have just effective runoffs. Uh, and, you know, they were going for clear beer, you know, once the Pilsner malt, et cetera, came out. And so it just seems that the step mash might not have just been to serve the purpose of, mod- um, of uh, conversion, but also had some other ancillary effects, such as uh, mitigating beta-glucan um, in terms of the mash process, uh, you know, in the brew house as well as the final product. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's always fascinating to me to think about why we do the things that we do, right? Why are we doing, you know, somebody had to decide at some point that this is the right temperature, you know, to to, to do this. And they didn't have any understanding of enzymes at the time, right? I mean, there's, there's no way that the first people that were brewing that set up the brewing process knew that enzymes were acting on uh, uh, and all this was happening underneath the hood. Um, so it's always fascinating. And I think you're right, right? I mean, you could certainly, like, you, you got a problem. Problem. Dang, whenever I, you know, mash at this really high temperature, when the water is really hot, when I can't stick my arm in it anymore, um, you know, the it's always really sticky and I can't ever get it to come out, you know, but if I can still stick my arm in the water, then we're good. And I let it sit there for, you know, 30 minutes or so. And then I've got a nice like fermentable beer. I mean, I could totally see something like that happen, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so it's amazing to think how much of the stuff that we have today uh, was kind of although rooted in science, they didn't necessarily know that that was the scientific solution uh, or the reason why it worked. Right. And so, uh, tradition ultimately has been confirmed or denied via scientific research in the modern era. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, there's a lot of things also that we can kind of do away with, with, uh, uh, you know, in terms of science, but, but at least when we're talking about this malt, right. And malt modification and, uh, the mash regime back to your original comment on that. I think it does tell a really interesting story. Just like you said, you know, the well modified malts that we have, uh, you know, they did perform better under the EBC mash than in the infusion mash, but they still performed fine, right? They still did great. When you're in those unmodified malt conditions, maybe like if you're using an adjunct like rye or sorghum or wheat or something like that, maybe in those conditions, it does make sense to do a step mash. Um, but like you said, to get more of that enzymatic activity. Um, so, or, you know, uh, maybe that's a better way to do it. I'm not really sure, but it does kind of tell this nice uh, story about modification and mash regime. Yeah, I mean, when's the last time you heard of anyone talking about routinely getting a stuck mash uh, with a 100% barley malt single infusion? It doesn't happen. Yeah, no. It, it, it's all about, um, when you think of stuck mash, you think of two things. High use of adjuncts like wheat or oats or whatever. And the other thing, actually, is you can get a stuck mash when doing a super imperial, like barrel-aged intended uh, imperial stout uh, grist. The mashes on those are intense how you know they say pack as much malt as you can physically fit in <laughs> and then as little water as necessary to get a runoff and they recommend using rice holes on these imperial stout brew days because you can get a stuck mash even if it's all barley malt and i've experienced that myself and so uh clearly there are certain situations uh, that are gonna uh challenge what i just said but generally speaking if you're doing an all barley single infusion you're not having problems with runoff or clear beer for that matter, uh, we can get beer clear, right? And it seems that the modern modification is helping mitigate the need for a Congress mash, both on the fermentability and um, it seems that the modern modification of malts is really challenging the need for a Congress mash, both in terms of the beta glucan content, as well as the you know fermentability and the efficiency of the mash in terms of the uh, amount of sugar that we're able to uh, extract. I mean, I totally agree with that. And 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 one of the things that I it just like hit me while you were talking to this. You just mentioned rice holes, right? We're using rice holes to mitigate stuck sparges. We're filtering the wort in the EBC mash, right? So you're like you're filtering this, um, you know. So um, and so I'm I'm wondering too, like, okay, were you maybe the rice holes are serving some sort of filtration? action. And that's why the viscosity measurements, you know, weren't necessarily as uh, important in this episode. I mean, I'm I'm just kind of like talking out of my butt here a little bit as I like start to think through this is like, why didn't we see higher viscosity in this? Maybe it's because of that filtration step, because essentially Sophie used rice holes um, in the in, you know, the the lot of the laddering step. And so maybe that helped with the word viscosity. Maybe if there was no filtration, this would have created a really sticky beer with under modified malts in the infusion mash as I, I don't know. Uh, but that anyway, that just popped into my head. Um, and the last uh, uh, process, the last part of this, the final effect um, that Sophie tested was the presence of caramel malts. Um, and so caramel malts have a high starting concentration of beta glucans because of the malting process. Um, they're they're um, uh, create, turned into caramel malts before uh, most of that enzymatic package happens, right? I mean, think about how caramel malts are made. They're steeped and then they're boiled, right? Uh, and then uh, dried so that the caramelization happens. Um, 
So there's not necessarily a, a conversion um, of those starches into, you know, fermentable sugars or anything like that that we're doing uh, as a, a, you know, as brewers. So it has a high starting beta glucanase, beta glucan percentage. Um, and she saw that in her results that malts that or that that malt bills that had the presence of caramel malts um, had higher beta glucan starting contents and higher beta glucan ending contents. And did she see that th- that there was lesser beta glucanase uh present because my guess is that you would like blow that off you know denature it in a caramelization process yeah well i wonder uh, you know because you have maybe i you know i don't know that i saw that in the notes i'd have to go back and look because she there's still going to be beta glucan uh present in the malt so these weren't like 100 percent caramel caramel malt sure. beers right it was 10 or 20 percent caramel and actually that's that raises another uh, a good point too i said in all cases the caramel malts contributed to higher beta glucans but the in the two row batch the base beer which was 100 percent two row and the 10 percent caramel malt were actually statistically the same in terms of beta glucan activity so that makes me think maybe the well modified two row and and Pilsner malts have enough beta glucanase to deal with specialty grains, right? Um, to deal with caramel malts or something like that. But at 20% caramel malt, that's where they saw a significantly higher beta glucanase uh, uh, activity. Now, that's in the two row. The Pilsner saw higher uh, beta glucans in each condition. The 100% Pilsner, 10% caramel, and 20% caramel with Pilsner malts all saw increased uh, beta glucans. And that's because they already have more beta glucans in the in that particular malt, regardless of what the uh, caramel malts adding or taking away. Yeah, exactly. Well, the caramel malts, yeah, the it, maybe it's lower beta, uh, made, maybe it's lower um, um, uh, beta glucanase activity um, mm-hmm. in the pilsner, mm-hmm. right? Maybe it's lower enzyme package. So this is another thing that you brought up a couple times in the show that maybe is really uh, is really a piece of this. I wish I could ask Sophie this question. Maybe I'll email it to her. Is like the um, the enzyme uh package right like how much of does these grains have of starting beta glucanase right and because one of the big takeaways from sophie's research was that starting beta glucan level correlated highly with ending beta glucan level in all uh mash conditions worse in infusion mash with under modified malts um and worse in infusion mash with caramel malts um and so i'm wondering too and I, I, it, maybe we talked about it in the show. It's just blanking on me. Maybe starting beta glucanase activity. I can't remember if that correlated or didn't correlate, right? Because like infusion mash, so much higher temperature. Even if you had a high starting beta glucanase activity, maybe you're just killing everything off, <laughs> you know. And, and so that's why the infusion mash is just higher, um, you know. And, and maybe there is sort of an argument for if you're, especially if you're using an under modified malt or some sort of adjunct or a high level of caramel malts. Maybe there is an argument to start your mash a little bit lower so that you get some of that beta glucanase activity. Right, and I kind of wonder too i wonder if decoction has any impact here um historically you know that was used and uh we're getting really hot we're boiling the grains and the wort at that point um and like we talked about earlier a mash out can seems to help with laudering even though you're well above the optimal range for the enzymatic activity that works on the beta glucans just makes me wonder if heat uh, at a certain point it's not so much enzymatic it's like you know kinetics or something <laughs> yeah, uh, and right. i wonder how i just wonder how decoction would play into this yeah totally right i mean at some point heat right the like heat's gonna d- not uh, i mean yeah denature unravel the proteins right i mean that's just gonna happen because of because of heat um mm-hmm. you know so yeah i mean maybe it is maybe when you get up to boil maybe that releases a whole bunch of beta glucans and that's one of the reasons why decoction is you know prized in the way it is i mean i'm not I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I don't know. Um, that, that'd be an interesting one. Decoction kept coming into my mind, though, too. Although, I mean, again, that's one of those things. I'm not sure how many people are out there decocting everything. You're probably doing it in check pills, but, you know, I uh, or, you know, box or something like that. Uh, some some intense, heavily, uh, you know, heavily caramelized German beers. Uh, but uh, I don't know how many people are decocting. I know you do it, though. Yeah, I mean, I think that really the only one decocting these days is really lager focused uh, breweries in America. And then obviously Germans and Czechs, some of them are still doing it. Czechs are really into it, I gather. I think a lot of German brewers are probably at this point just favoring a step mash. Um, But yeah, even 
more uh, to look into in terms of beta glucans. So maybe we can quickly summarize what we just heard and then talk a little bit about our tips and tricks for uh, you know dealing with beta glucans in the mash. Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll ask you this question then as sort of like a summary question. So what's your what's your takeaway from this, right? Having listened to this episode, having now broken down the science, um, what's your big takeaway about beta-glucans and beta-glucanase? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've learned that caramel malts, uh, higher starting single infusion approaches and under modified malts are going to increase the amount of beta-glucan uh, in your final beer. However, thinking about it from a practical perspective, it's like, well, why does that matter? Why do I care? Because we have things like rice holes. We have things like gelatin. Uh, these are, there are other ways that we can go about making beer and not even really worrying about the beta glucan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so then why are you even doing step mashes, Jordan? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, not for beta glucan, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, but yeah, it, exactly. It, th- this is a nice little bit of confirmation bias, right? That it's like, ah, I'm not crazy. There's one more reason that I can do it. Yeah, I mean, that was a big takeaway for me, right, is is we spend a lot of time talking about the differences between Congress and infusion and saying, like, infusion seems a little bit what like more like what most people are doing. Um, but people are still using both of these. And and to your point, you know, yeah, so there were higher beta glucans, uh, you know, in the infusion mash. But do I care? Right. I've made a whole bunch of beers, um, you know, with infusion, you know, uh, with high uh, single infusion mashes and I haven't had a stuck sparge, you know? Um, so maybe it's not a big problem for me in my brewing practices, but if you are having stuck sparges or you're having issues with, uh, some of those flavor components, um, yeah, haze or something, maybe that's a reason. Maybe that'd be an idea is to just start, you know, start at a lower temperature for your mash and then raise, uh, through the, uh, sacrification a little bit more quickly, uh, more like that EBC mash. So these are just, again, you know, tools in your toolkit. And again, it's it's really cool for me to see there's other things going on than just conversion of starch to sugar, right? There's And what happens to the beta glucans? I mean, that's one thing I'm interested too, because it makes me wonder, like, are they just floating around in solution? And they're just, you know, I mean, they get broken down into other process, but into what? Do they turn into flavor components? Do they get used in like yeast health, right? I mean, if they're proteins and they get broken down into proteins, I'm sure those proteins get used by something. Um, so it makes me wonder where, where that goes. I'm sure Sophie could give us some information on that, but again, not the scope um, of, of, of her study. Uh, but yeah, what am I going to do in my, uh, in my brewing? I'm probably still going to continue using infusion mashes and not worry too much about beta glucans. Although I will say, um, having just brewed an adjunct locker with a whole bunch of really sticky rice, um, uh, I'm, uh, rice holes are awesome. And I might, uh, I, I think I might be next time adding some beta glucanase into that mash because that thing got super sticky. Like uh, just the rice, if it's really funny too. If you do like a cereal mash with just the rice, it starts to look like porridge consistency. It's like super sticky and super gummy. But then you add just a little bit of malted barley in there and it goes... Whoosh, and it like totally turns into like syrup and liquid. It's amazing to see. You can actually like physically, visibly uh, see it. So that's pretty cool. I'm sure rice has very low beta glucanase activity. It's a very low enzymatic capacity um, uh, in general. But yeah, that's kind of what I'm going to do. So I'm probably going to continue with um, infusion mashes, not worrying too much about beta glucans unless I'm using under modified malts or uh, adjuncts. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too worried about it. And I've just been using rice holes when using uh, high wheat percentage beers, uh, which as we've learned, apparently isn't even a major source of beta glucans to begin with, but maybe it's function <laughs> well, of beta glucanase. Maybe not um, as high as barley, still maybe a, a you know, still maybe right. a, a high source, just not as high as a percentage of barley. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh, m- uh, my homies at FH Steinbart uh, hooked me up with some Gluca Buster from Cellar Science, and uh, it says that it improves lottering. Um, it's an enzyme trio of beta glucanase, xylanase, and cellulase to prevent stuck mashes and improve lottering. So you just add a quarter teaspoon per five gallons um, at mash in. And, uh, and it says store refrigerated. So hopefully this is still good because I've been storing at room temp. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I haven't tried it yet, um, but it's supposed to work really well. Um, and so that's, I think, one strategy uh, beyond um, using the, uh, the rice holes. Um, obviously, if you're having problems with haze, you know, finings, uh, both on the kettle and uh, in the, um, the keg, uh, you know, gelatin, silica, you know, et cetera. Uh, good old time. Um, you know, I had a beer recently that just would not clear. 
Um, <laughs> West Coast Pilsner, I use gelatin. And now I'm wondering, I wonder if I just had too much uh, beta glucans left in solution and I did not effectively mitigate it throughout my mash. Uh, and it's just stuck there. Is there any evidence that this could create a more persistent haze? I, I think you've got your next brewlosophy experiment, right? Like West coast pills with the, what, what was the name of the enzyme? Uh, well, it's a trio and the brands called, uh, by cellar science glucobuster, but it's beta glucanase, xylanase and cellulase. Yeah. Yeah. Glucobuster, right? That sounds like your next experiment, right? Brew it again, use glucobuster in it. And then if one of them clears and the other one doesn't, then boom, you've got some sort of an answer, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, another thing that I've had happen is on a imperial stout, uh, you can get this like goop at the bottom of your vessel, uh, that you've like that your finished beer is resting in like a keg or, or whatever. Um, and you'll see brewers like post this on like the brewer Reddit. It's this like, like almost like a SCOBY and it's incredible. The stuff that's fallen out of solution. And I've always assumed, well, I guess that makes sense. So much malt went into this wort that there's just more proteins bound in solution. And so they actually recommend, uh, do lager your Russian Imperial stouts, or, you know, big imperial stouts before they go into barrel because stuff is going to fall to solution. And that way it can be in your lagering tank, not in your wooden barrels. Right. <laughs> and this episode has made me wonder, maybe that's actually beta glucans that are stuck in solution because we heard in the episode that um, it can contribute to a haze, but also particulates that uh, create like a gunk at the bottom of your fermenter. And so maybe these big imperial stouts you're just putting so much malt in solution that means you're also putting more beta glucans in solution and so uh lagering your imperial stouts before they go into barrel can be uh, maybe another way to counteract the inevitable beta glucan uh, issue yeah for sure i mean at up to 20 percent. i mean that paper said up to 20 percent of barley it could be beta glucans right so i mean that's 20 percent of the mass that you're putting in per 100 grams of dried uh dry malted barley uh it could be beta glucans i'm sure that's under modified and a whole bunch of other caveats but still like you said that's a huge volume um of of substance that you're putting in there that maybe it does just fall out and create this like sticky goo um at the bottom of your fermenter well jordan we talked a lot about beta glucans and beta gluconate is there anything else that you wanted to add i did not realize it was possible to talk about this topic for this long so the two hours <laughs> at this point I'm, <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> no but yeah it's incredible it was really interesting um this is one of those ones you see the title you kind of groan like oh great uh but it's like who knew big <laughs> glue cans were so fascinating and it seems to be a really uh under the radar topic that we all have a lot more to learn about yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait to see. I think Sophie's got some more research coming out, um, or at least hopefully she does. And and uh, we'll get her back on the show whenever she does that. Uh, and I know UC Davis is looking at a whole bunch of other proteins and things and how they're um, interacting, not just during the mash, but throughout the whole brewing process. So I think this is going to be something that's highly studied in the future and pretty exciting to see. So, well, cool. Well, thanks, Jordan, for uh, chatting about beta glucans with me. Yeah, thanks for doing that as always. All right, well, Jordan and I will be back in two weeks with our next Applying the Science episode. And until then, be sure to check out the Brewlosophy podcast, the Hop Chronicle, Short and Shoddy, Brew It Yourself Experiments, the Brewlosophy show, uh, and everything else we're up to at brewlosophy.com. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, the Brewlosophy podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.